thank you um, for the introduction, Morton, and um, thanks everybody for coming. I have to say it's a real honor to um, address a group like this beyond just the pleasures of <laughs> being in person and hearing work uh, from new friends again. Um, I'm also thankful, thankful to um, the organizers of the conference for the invitation to speak at this event, because I think that uh, the event's delayed timing, delayed again and again, has put us in a suspended interval that can be productive for reflecting on how new themes or methods in a research community branch out along different pathways over a short span of 10 years or longer, depending on how you experienced uh, ANT and coming into music studies. These pathways ultimately amount to two directions. Are we making sparks, desedimenting thought, following a speculation to see where it might lead? Or are we resolving contradictions, isolating and correcting errors, systematizing the analytic and shoring up its defenses? Both pathways are critically important to the intellectual life of a scholarly community. I favor the former, however, and indeed, it was the speculative spirit of Bruno Latour's early work that drew me to it nearly 20 years ago when I was a PhD student at UC San Diego. I'm talking about the rambunctious early texts in the sociology of science and knowledge, which seemed so chaotic and excessive, despite the sardonic fussiness of Latour's many rules of method, his numbered lists of principles, and his Baroque taxonomies of concepts. I can never really take seriously these attempts at systematization. The writing's very partiality, its unfinished quality is precisely what I liked about it. This was the same quality that I admired in Foucault, who likewise always struggled to formulate his system or his rules of method, forever offering preliminary outlines, uh, but turning to the next project or question before reaching finality. Similar to what Hannah Arendt said about Marx, such fundamental flagrant failures rarely occur in second-rate writers. Whatever their blind spots, these thinkers made the world look and feel so different. So in this talk, I will continue to bind together Latour and Foucault because the philosopher's work on power and knowledge seems such an obvious and strong pressure on Latour's early period in sociology of science. As Latour himself has noted, ANT is in effect the same result as that obtained by Michel Foucault when he dissolved the notion of a power held by the powerful in favor of micropowers diffused through the many technologies to discipline and keep it in line. It is simply, it, ANT, is simply an expansion of Foucault's notion uh, to the many techniques employed in machines and the hard sciences. There have been many Latours, of course, but this Foucauldian one has been the most generative for me. When I wrote my 2014 um, article on actor networks in music history, I experienced it as a departure because though I was interested in method and the clarification of research principles, my, goal, my goals were always more directed toward making arguments about my own specific areas of music history. Those included the historiography of experimentalism and experimentalism otherwise, race and improvisation in an article on London and the Henry Cow book, technical arrangements of co-laboring in deadness um, or modernism in an essay on John Cage and nature. In none of those publications was I concerned with making arguments about actors, agents, or networks. Rather, these methodological concepts um, from actor network theory helped me to make more specific arguments about my materials. The method article then came as an opportunity to make explicit what had been present in those other texts or to make clear what might have slipped past less attentive readers. In addition to some discussions of agency and networks, I also speculated a bit on matters of genre, context, influence, temporality, and power. As ever, I was most interested in insights, sparks, and leads, not systematization, which I would leave to others more suited to that kind of work. I tend to develop obsessions with topics, reading deeply and widely around them, and then publish the results of that project. So for that reason, I don't have a lot of new material 
on the subject of agency in music history, because my thoughts about it are summed up in that 2014 article. But there have been a number of very important further contributions to this line of thinking, and I draw your attention in particular to the double issue of Contemporary Music Review, edited by Georgina Bourne and Andrew Berry in 2018. The editor's introduction provides an informed and critical literature review on the topic, and the contributors make a number of thoughtful and original responses to actor network theory. I want to highlight a few of um, the insights that these authors develop in concert with their editors. The first comes from Patrick Valiquet, who is here at least virtually for the event this week. In his article on a laptop orchestra in Canada, he draws attention to the value of noticing breaks, absences, and externalities in a given socio-musical situation. Because they are mediated, agencies can drop out of an analysis, denied or hidden by what is most evidently present. In such cases, we might recall William James's point that we experience the relation between terms in as real a fashion as we experience the terms or the actors themselves. That means that an obscured agency can also be observed in its mediations. In any case, Bourne and Barry wisely direct their readers to Foucault's comments on the dispositif, which enrolls, as he famously commented, the said as much as the unsaid. The project of identifying precisely the nature of the connections among these elements, Foucault remarks, can yield evidence of how a particular discourse can figure at one time as the program of an institution, and at another, it can function as a means of justifying or masking a practice which itself remains silent. I'll return to this matter of institutions masking a practice or rendering it silent. But the salient point here is the attention that Foucault gives to the silent actor, the unsaid or the hidden. My teacher, Sherry Tucker, had a succinct way of teasing out the unsaid in the domain of gender by insisting on the generative value of a simple question, where are the women? Indeed, the imperative to notice absences or take account of what is hidden, marginalized, or excluded, this imperative I experienced acu acutely in the writing of my first book. There I wrote, I'm going to quote myself, which is completely insufferable. Um, I wrote that testing the quotidian, the accepted, the given, can reveal the unknown, the unnoticed, the extraordinary, the otherwise. In fact, this collection of denied, hidden, or marginalized actors is precisely the referent of the otherwise uh, of that book's title. In his fine article on the harpsichord fad of the 1960s, this is back to the CMR collection, Charlie Croningold makes a convincing case for why aesthetic matters reveal complexities that exceed the frameworks of A&T. His discussion of the actors brought to the surface by the fad leads him to conclude that Latour's requirements uh, to be an actor are too strong, and that one needs a subtler language of partial, superfluous, or inconsequential actors to describe accurately a wide but superficial phenomenon like a trend. Moreover, Cronengold's subtle treatment of these actors and their relations highlights a need for clearer language in matters of inference and explanation. Not just, uh, not just descriptions of the fact of making a difference, but also evaluations of the quality of that difference, or what Bourne and Barry call diverse transformative processes, including causation, catalysis, imitation, amplification, differentiation, or resistance. Identifying these processes, they argue, requires crossing temporal scales to a degree that has not been available in ANT. Media, infrastructures, formats, and genre all mediate these transformations at large scales, and I'll come shortly to the ways that I've been thinking about the temporal significance of form as a constraint on possibility. Born and Barry connect Latour's aversion to considering larger temporal scales to his reluctance to engage with more abstract social theories at the macro level. I would respond with a note of caution that such a reluctance comes not from naivete or stubbornness, or not only from them, 
but also from a methodologically considered position, one shared with Foucault, who outlined how those grand political and social theories are themselves the constructs of totalizing regimes of thought. Totalizing abstractions produce, in addition to their grand political questions, forms of subjugated knowledge that can be detailed through local descriptive criticism. Not an ascetic refusal of theory, Foucault writes, but an autonomous, non-centralized kind of theoretical production, one that is to say whose validity is not dependent on the approval of established regimes of thought. We can also recall Foucault's defense of his descriptive method. He says he cultivates a suspicion of grand abstractions like power, beginning his analysis with the how of its operation rather than the what of its substance, he says, because of all the things that might escape one's view while endlessly marking time before the same old questions, what is power and where does it come from? So I think that Latour and Foucault before him advocated for the value of setting, um, setting aside those familiar regimes of thought, those grand social theories, in order to open up a view that might have been obscured. This goes back to the two pathways I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, toward a kind of chaotic generation rather than a re-territorialized systematization. Nonetheless, I am in broad agreement with Born and Barry because although Foucault was committed to the revelation of subjugated knowledges, Latour has done nothing of the sort. Indeed, as the editors note, Latour's actors are invariably Machiavellian. They are always competitive, aggressive, um, accumulating allies and territories, doing battle with enemies until their final victory. One gets the sense that Latour has, had internalized Foucault's description of politics as the continuation of war by other means. Born and Barry observed that behind this Machiavellian mask, Latour's actors retain the familiar form of the sovereign individual subject of liberal humanism, and he otherwise declines to engage any of the diverse frameworks of theorizing subjectivity. Another comparison with Foucault is instructive here. Recall that Foucault distinguished between relations of power and relations of domination. Power relations are always based on some degree of freedom. Those who try to control, determine, and limit the freedom of others are themselves free individuals who have at their disposal certain instruments they can use to govern, govern others. Thus, the basis for all this is freedom, the relationship of the self to itself and the relationship to the other. But when freedom is severely curtailed, then one cannot properly analyze a given situation as a relation of power. When an individual or social group succeeds in blocking a field of power relations, immobilizing them and preventing any reversibility of movement by economic, political, or military means, one is faced with what might be called a state of domination. In such a state, it is certain that practices of freedom do not exist or exist only unilaterally or are extremely constrained and limited. The point for Foucault isn't to dissolve power relations, which would be impossible, but to acquire the techniques, rules, and morality that will allow, quoting him, that will allow us to play these games of power with as little domination as possible. Yet Latour does not appear to make the same distinction between power and domination. While Foucault frequently stood accused of portraying power as a system of domination that controls everything and that leaves no room for freedom, we can identify in Latour the opposite tendency. His actors often seem utterly free to enter into and exit out of contingent power arrangements. Although he never fails to take note of how any action is changed and translated by the resistance of mediators, he also cheerfully details the fragility and reversibility of any given arrangement. But if every network is reversible, then what of the possibility of domination? Another difference can be found in the two writers' approaches to subjectivity. While Latour details and celebrates those movements when, uh, quote, a few people gain strength and go inside some places to modify other places and the life of the multitudes. 
Foucault attended far more closely to the ways that an individual subject might free itself from those very same modifications. As numerous commentators have pointed out, Latour largely restricts himself to stories of monstrous genesis, of the assembly of disparate and unruly forces and materials into stable systems that channel flows, delegate action at a distance, and monitor obligatory points of passage. ANT seems to foreground the positivities of knowledge production at the expense not only of the negativities of violence and exclusion, but also um, of those unnoticed or unstable associations that do not form lasting networks. Foucault, on the other hand, became increasingly interested in practices of freedom that could modify the networks that produce subjectivity. Genealogical critique, he wrote, will separate out from the contingency that has made us what we are, the possibility of no longer being, doing, or thinking what we are, do, or think. <laughs> he often referred to this process as detaching oneself from oneself or getting free of oneself. By detailing techniques of the self that can reduce domination, Foucault exhibited a keen awareness that an actor's freedom of movement was a precarious achievement. In other words, one actor's ability to conduct the conduct of another or to modify the self might be severely constrained or taken away altogether by another actor or arrangement of actors. In such a state of domination, the subject becomes an actor who no longer acts. Uh, but remains part of the analytical picture. For Latour, by contrast, an actor that has been rendered inactive by, strong, immutable, uh, by a strong immutable set of associations is not an actor at all. Such once actors find no place in his analytic. So this issue of the retreating actor, or better, the non-subject or the non-agent, that is defined or undefined by its very non-relationality, <laughs> all of this constitutes a certain problem for actor network theory. And this problem is taken up, I think, with greater scrutiny in other branches of contemporary critical thought, most notably in the New Black Studies. In his 2010 article, Blackness and Nothingness, for example, Fred Moten clarifies the problem of theorizing a sociology, a sociality when the individual sovereignty that is the basis of relation itself has been rendered impossible. He desires a sociology of relations that would somehow account for the radically non-relational, but, but this only insofar as relationality is understood to be an expression of power structured by the givenness of a transcendental subjectivity. The givenness and substantiveness of transcendental subjectivity is assured by a relative nothingness, by which he means black non-subjectivity. Um, Gavin, back to the CMR issue, Gavin Stein goes writing on accidents, obstructions, and failures in South African electronic music moves in the space opened up by Moten and others on the question of ontology. His interlocutors de-emphasize the way that their technological co-actors are constituted through relations and instead value the autonomy of certain objects. When networks are constantly breaking down or malfunctioning, as in the case of his South African interlocutors, a stable component that can function independently of other mediators assumes great importance. Yet, Steingo writes, a genuinely non-relational ontology remains difficult to grasp for many contemporary academics. He continues, strong relationality and the proliferation of associations has been the bread and butter of both colonial apparatuses and capitalist corporations. If this is so, then perhaps a non-relational ontology provides the outlines of a new politics, not of production, but of refusal, not of circulation, but of stasis, not of relationality, but of withdrawal. So with Steingo's non-relational ontology and Moten's sociology of the radically non-relational, one has the sense that the conversation has moved on from ANT's conceptualization of actors and agents. 
Born and Barry put it diplomatically, quoting them, if 15 years ago the idea of taking seriously the contribution of non-human actors was cutting edge, perhaps it no longer needs to be labored, end quote. I really agree with this assessment. And in some of my own recent work, I have turned away from identifying agents and toward the institutional forms that they act within and produce or that they articulate through their actions. This returns us again to the theme of the fifth Sibelius Academy Symposium, perhaps with a more general or weaker working definition of institutions than is generally the norm. It comes unsurprisingly by now uh, uh, in this talk from Foucault. The term institution is generally applied to every kind of more or less constrained learned behavior. Everything which functions in a society uh, as a system of constraint and which isn't an utterance, in short, all the field of the non-discursive social is an institution. Institutions constrain action through material means, of course, such as paper records or storage devices. But they also depend on, those, on these material agents to produce repetitions, patterns, and regularities, which create form. Ultimately, it's impossible to separate the two, matter and form, of course, but I would now like to open up two examples that will aid the transition from a discussion of actors and agents to one of form and eventually institutions. In both of these cases, an, um, an investigation of the specific or the individual leads to insights about the general or form. Let me say a few things about the choreographer and filmmaker Yvonne Rayner and the composer and musician John Cage. Students of Rayner's work will already be familiar with her bracing contributions to the history of dance, uh, which can be summarized for those new to her in the following famous passage that she published in 1965. No to spectacle, no to virtuosity, no to transformations and magic and make-believe, no to the glamour and transcendency of the star image, no to the heroic, no to the anti-heroic, no to trash imagery, no to involvement of performer or spectator, no to style, no to camp, no to seduction of spectator by the wiles of the performer, no to eccentricity, no to moving or being moved. With this no manifesto, Rayner rejected the theatricality of classical and modern dance and their manipulative relationship between the performer and her spectator. Along with her colleagues in the Judson Dance Theater from 1962 to 1964, Rayner searched for a choreography stripped of the illusions of the charismatic socialist, um, socialist, the charismatic soloist. Just talking about socialism earlier. Is there such a thing? Um, she wrote, it's easy to see why the grand jeté had to be abandoned. One cannot do a grand jeté. One must dance it to get it done at all i.e. invest it with all the necessary nuances of energy distribution that will produce the look of climax together with the still suspended extension in the middle of the movement. Like a romantic overblown plot, this particular kind of display has finally in this decade exhausted itself. As critics like Annette Michelson and Peggy Phelan have made clear, Rayner found the narrative structures of traditional performance to be narcissist, narcissistic and deceptive. In their place, she offered literal movements that were simply executed rather than staged and performed. Stand up, um, move a chair, run, drag a mattress. These simple tasks were pulled straight from daily life, which Rayner thought focused one's attention on the action itself rather than on the persona of the doer. And by averting the gaze of the dancers, like we see here, away from the audience and keeping their expressions neutral, Rayner further undermined the naturalized framework of the dance. Finally, in the uh, phrasing of landmark works like Trio A, which is what that was, Rayner eliminated the sense of beginnings, middles, or ends, um, creating in their place a fragmentary flow that avoided climaxes or memorable moments of repose. 
Um, that's, uh, that is Rayner dancing Trio A in 1978 for the camera. In some, Rayner's innovations cleared away some of the most salient conventions uh, that had persisted into the post-war period in theater and dance. These residual structures of narrative spectatorship, stage charisma, and movement phrasings, uh, mus movement phrasing, threatened to take one out of a direct engagement with the movement or event at hand in front of you. That's why I, considers, uh, I consider Rayner's work until about 1966 to have exhibited a certain anti-formalism, where form is understood as generalization or abstraction from the particular to enable its repetition. Of course, I don't mean this in a complete sense because Rayner still used notation and rehearsal to create her own regularities from event to event, but she seemed highly motivated to eliminate those forms of form that one inherits from traditions of the stage. Tradition supplies forms the right and expected way that things are done. It constrains possibility. Once Rayner had succeeded in clearing these out to these forms, her attention turned to other kinds of form in the shambolic portfolio works of the late 1960s, the ones that eventually gave way to her first film, Lives of Performers. I'm referring to the dances that are uh, referred, um, that are uh, titled Performance Demonstration, Rose Fractions, and Culminating in Continuous Project Altered Daily, which will be the focus of my, uh, the rest of my commentary on Rayner. It is not easy to summarize these dances <laughs> uh, for those who are not familiar with them. They combine set bits of choreography with improvisation and props and Rayner often worked with a group of regular colleagues and former collaborators from the Judson Dance Theater. These included Becky Arnold, Steve Paxton, Douglas Dunn, David Gordon, and Barbara Dilley. As this list of technical requirements for continuous project altered daily makes clear, the performance drew upon a lot of media resources, film projectors, tape recorders, live mics, and an array of props and wardrobe changes. What did they actually do? There were 2D sections, solos, duets, and trios. There was a lot of speech, improvised or natural conversation, as well as recitations of found text. Rayner explained in a document of the time that the types of danced activity included previously learned material that wasn't yet polished, uh, which would require yet more talking and even disagreement. Uh, lately, I have begun to question the accustomed exclusion in performance of the interaction that led to the realization, she remarked at the time. Um, it might also involve run-throughs and the process that she referred to as working out or the creation of new material during the performance. It might include surprises, the introduction of new objects or activities without notice, um, as well as behavior brought in from the world of everyday movement, spontaneously or by plan. She distinguished and encouraged behavior of a professional and amateur nature. In sum, Rayner created a certain bricolage of composed movement patterns, movement patterns and other kinds of everyday and real behavior, so-called real behavior, uh, that we might be tempted to call informal, <laughs> though I will argue for a different understanding. When someone is learning new material during a performance, their mistakes are real, and their comportment defaults to its so-called natural state. The same could be said for surprises, which only surprise insofar as they spur the body to offer its own reactions. As I mentioned earlier, Rayner's fascination with the intermixture of choreographed movement and everyday gesture began during her years in the Judson Dance Theater, when dancers investigated simple movements uh, and tasks that were borrowed from everyday life. When I first started dancing in performances, she wrote in 1973, somebody said, but she always walks as though she's in the street. By saying no to virtuosity and spectacle, Rayner made room for the plain but intricate habits of gesture that one, um, one outlines unconsciously every day. My walk looks different from your walk. Both take place outside the ordering frame of spectatorship, 
or the narrative control of a story. Such habits are not identical to personality, but they occupy the same general zone. They both work on large time scales. You cannot develop a personality or a habit quickly. And they both render the future somewhat predictable through repetition. I will probably walk away from this podium in the same way that I have always walked. And my personality likewise predicts how I might respond to some surprise. Habit and personality are both means of abstraction from any particular moment because they always refer to other moments, classing them into a generalization. They too are formal, in other words, moving from the concrete to the general and placing some constraint on future action. So these works by Rayner, <clears throat> then they play with different forms of form. A form is a regularity or a repetition, a call out from this moment, this action to others that are like it. A notated choreography, a memorized movement pattern, a personal gesture, a spontaneous improvisation. I think Rayner wanted to figure out what they had in common and what kinds of problems the investigation could generate. In fact, the concept of authorship soon emerged as one clear practical and philosophical problem as Rayner and her colleagues no longer felt justified claiming authorial ownership of the spontaneous behaviors and inventions of others. It may seem strange to assert that I am the author of my walk, but it is even stranger to claim that Rayner is. These concerns, uh, these concerns led Rayner to bring Continuous Project Altered Daily to an end in 1970, after it, start, after it had started to accrue many contributions from the other dancers. The group soon formed a leaderless ensemble devoted to collective improvisation, the Grand Union, it was called. Although this ensemble continued until 1976, Rayner left in 72 and soon began her career as a filmmaker, where she continued to explore her long running concerns with the gaze, narrative expectation, artifice, performance of the self, charisma, uh, and persona that is with forms of spe spectatorship and subjectivation of the stage and screen. So while Rayner reflected on the various forms of form <laughs> in a direct and persistent way, John Cage encountered the same problematic less consciously in the 1960s and 70s. And like Rayner, Cage had to face the question of authorship posed by his transformations of practice. But I will come back to those in a minute. For a composer like Cage, a consideration of form arises most clearly in the terms of governance. Out of the infinite possibilities that the future holds, um, how does the composer ensure one set of possible outcomes instead of another? How does one conduct, conduct the conduct of a performer, as Foucault might have said? This question acquired heightened significance for composers of indeterminate music since a relatively wide range of outcomes is ostensibly permitted. Um, as Cage was fond of saying, permission granted, but not to do whatever you want. For works of indeterminate music, a score creates a useful kind of form, as Natalie Heron has shown in her book on fluxus forms. Indeterminate scores offer diagrams of relations that are portable but consistent. In the context of this talk, though, I am more interested in following Cage away from the score and into the domain of practice, where he collaborated primarily with the pianist David Tudor and other close associates uh, from the early 1960s until the middle of the next decade. Through the performance of his own scores, pieces like Cartridge Music and the Variation series, I think that Cage experimented, perhaps unwittingly, <laughs> with improvised forms of govern governance that were new to him. I am emphasizing formalism because the interpretation of Cage's work has tended to focus on the material or the anti-formal. Uh, the open world of all sounds only becomes available once we get rid of the abstractions of formal listening, right? Uh, they obstruct our access to sounds in themselves uh, by continually relating them to other sounds. That's the common understanding of Cage, I think. Uh, it's one that I share, too. 
Uh, it's chance operations that are supposed to disrupt those formalisms, right, and deliver us to the accidents of uh, real life, real life, or everyday life. Um, so keeping in mind my loose sense of form as a generalization from the particular, I'd like to relate Cage's practical engagement with improvisation and chance to a new set of formal sciences that emerged in the 19th century. When statistics achieved a certain taming of chance, as Ian Hacking and others have documented. Indeed, in that longer history of modernity, chance has never been only a disruptive event unfolding on the plane of the material. The speculations of finance capitalism, the measurement of norms and their deviations, the statistical analysis of populations and disease, the assessment and management of risk and insurance, um, all of these protocols of state, scientific, and market administration engage with chance and indeterminacy on the formal level of calculation, prediction, and probability. They formalize uncertainty. In fact, we might say that artistic uses of chance, um, like these guys in the 20th century, the ones that search for disruption in the materiality of daily life and so on, they encounter their mirror image in the bureaucratic uses of probability and risk in the 19th century, the ones that tame chance and uh, convert its, uncer uh, its uncertainty into something more predictable within limits. So in practice, Cage discovered little gaps between causes and consequences and how those gaps can be exploited towards specific ends. They are opportunities for prediction for the mitigation or exacerbation of risk, for the application of a rule or a protocol that can nudge an unknown outcome in some particular direction. One conducts ever so lightly the conduct of another. Cage understood this, at least in some inchoate way, but only when he moved out of the transcendental role of the composer and jumped down into the domain of practice, where he made decisions with the hand and the ear and drew on resources of predictability or risk mitigation that one only discovers in the trenches. Quoting Cage, the technical problems involved in any project tend to reduce the impact of the original idea, but in being solved, that is in practice, uh, they produce a situation different than anyone could have pre-imagined. So let me give an example that demonstrates the point that I want to make. Cage wrote Variations 4, and this is like one version of the score, Variations 4 quickly in 1963, while he was on the road with the Merce Cunningham Dance Company. The score asks its performers, who are almost always Cage and Tudor, <laughs> to drop transparencies of circles and dots onto a map of the performance space. Uh, and this process would yield the point of origin for each sound heard during the performance, uh, with much greater probability of sounds coming from outside the hall um, and through its open doors rather than inside the auditorium. Also, also possible, though statistically less frequent, were sounds that occurred in the total theater space or the public address system. Tudor and Cage would spend these performances walking around the space, into the wings, out through doors and into the lobby and the surrounding areas in pursuit of their next sound event. In other words, following the map. In October 1963, they arrived at the Arkansas Arts center theater in Little Rock to find the most elaborate control booth they had ever encountered. From this booth, one could send signals to loudspeakers inside and outside the auditorium, in the lobby, the wings, and the surrounding hallways. Having suffered an injury to his knee, uh, Tudor chose to remain at the control panel while Cage continued his uh, customary walking around. Cage's account, which he delivered 15 years later in an oral history interview, is a little bit hazy, but it appears that Tudor played records of opera, folk, classical, world, and dance music uh, from the booth, distributing the signals throughout the site through all of those loudspeakers. Cage described them as music the whole world loves, um, which was an allusion to a popular 1936 collection of national anthems and international folk songs that were arranged for piano 
I believe it was an improvised riff on one of the main ideas of the piece, music from other places, as in music from the lobby, not from in here, <laughs> outside the hall. Once Tudor had recovered from his injury, according to Cage, he elected to remain in the control booth for subsequent performances. So um, the pair, Cage and Tudor, recorded this road-tested uh, version of Variations 4 in January 1965 at the Feigen Palmer Gallery in Los Angeles in a benefit concert for the Foundation for Contemporary Performance Arts. According to the spoken introduction on the LP, the pair had set up two stations in the gallery's four rooms where they mixed signals from phonographs, tape machines, and microphones distributed throughout the space as well as out on the street, in keeping with the spirit of the score. The most prominent characteristic of the LP is its collage of, um, uh, of, of other records. Um, the composer Joseph Byrd offered this description in the liner notes. The elevator rides worth of Muzak, the passing conversation and the automobile argument, all mingle freely with Beethoven and the Balinese Gender Wayang. If you ask me, if, uh, oh no, Gender Wayang, end quote. If, like me, you have listened to this Everest Records LP um, and compared it with some puzzlement to the score of Variations 4, um, then the performance history, Arkansas, the control booth, the injured knee, um, that performance history might clarify why we hear what we hear when we listen to the recording. Cage liked to say that Variations 4 had suffered a variation, or it was really David Tudor's variation on Variations 4. I think these remarks fail to register the significance of the metamorph metamorphosis. By 1964, Cage had already ceased to, pro to provide measurements of time in his scores, and this change led him to present a new individual piece as less of a temporally demarcated thing than as a mode of activity or a diagram of relations that one entered into for a certain amount of any amount of time. As Cage explained uh, to the head of es Everest Records, who released that record, um, Variations 4 is not involved with beginnings or endings. The profound consequence of this passage from musical works to open-ended practice was that audiences heard performances of the Cage Tudor band more so than they heard Variations 4 or any of the other discrete works they were supposedly playing. The variation on Variations 4 stands in as representative of any variation delivered by the exigencies of performance itself, a variation made in this moment, tonight, and maybe for next week's concert too. In practice, where it counts, Cage and Tudor gradually lifted away from the score documents that had authorized their activities. This release is all but announced in the score to Variations 4. A performer need not confine himself to a performance of this piece. At any time, he may do something else. <laughs> and others, performing something else at the same time and place, may, when free to do so, enter into the performance of this. It's like he's saying, this piece will be whatever you do under its name. Indeed, for about a decade, beginning in 1964, these musicians, often with collaborators, tended to, treat, tended to treat titled works as generic containers for their practice. In some cases, it was almost as if works as diagrams of relations, um, like electronic setups or task structures, floated into and out of their playing. The playing was the foundation. The piece came and went. 
take the example of another work called Reunion, um, which was a titled event that took place in Toronto in 1968. It took the form of two chess matches, the first between Cage and Marcel Duchamp, and the second between Cage and Tini Duchamp. Tudor um, and a bunch of other collaborators produced um, sounds from pre-existing compositions, their compositions, but the audibility of these sounds and their location in the auditorium was determined by the position of the pieces on the chessboard that had been specially constructed by Lowell Cross for the event. About seven weeks later, Cage um, and uh, a smaller set of these collaborators played Reunion again, this time without Duchamp and without Lowell Cross at another university in um, Illinois, according to a flyer in Tudor's papers. But what should we make of a third performance just two weeks later by Cage, Tudor, and various music musicians and students at Mills College, one that again involved the wired chessboard, but that proceeded not under the name of Reunion, but rather of Cage's Variations Three. Again, I would suggest that audiences merely heard another performance by Cage and his band, uh, passing under the name, first of this work, then of that one, each title donned like a disguise or a uniform that rendered them both legible as works or illegible as practices. That's why I go back to the dispositi, they're rendered illegible by the institutions that they're working in. For Cage and his associates, these ambiguities over musical ontology created new questions and problems having to do with authorship and the status of the score. As a technology of repetition, the score makes some future event predictable when that event is carried out under its name. A working band likewise produces regularity, but it does so through its practice-led development of shared likes and dislikes, tendencies, and the unique background, training, and skills of each member. All of these things combine to make each of the band's concerts resemble the others in some way. When the production of predictability, or formalism, is reorganized around practice, the notated score can seem redundant or inefficient. In fact, Cage wrote to a very young Brian Eno in 1968, I have come to prefer music without notation, without rules. A few suggestions will set it going. What a curious way of putting it. <laughs> Cage makes a few suggestions to set it going. What is the it? Is it the performance? Is it the music? The piece? The improvisation? It's as, it's as if the music is a dance or a party that Cage joins rather than a gift or an object that he offers. Uh, indeed, once Cage um, had defined his role as a presenter of sounds in themselves, it must have been difficult to justify the status of composer or author, in which case the sounds are for him and not in themselves. The score for, the Cage, for Cage in 1968 would seem to preclude a situation defined by the collaboration with sounds. The latter figured as music. So dispensing with notation required Cage to dispense with a certain idea of authorship too. He wasn't alone. Upon hearing a performance of Variations II in 1968, the San Francisco critic Alfred Frankenstein wrote, one wonders why Cage is listed as the composer. The piece is actually an improvisation on amplified piano by David Tudor. Um, so uh, the, what I am trying to get at here is that the ambiguities around the question of authorship are not, I am there, it's not a work of hermeneutics coming out of uh, uh, the writings. It's perfectly present on the surface of the discourse at the time. So by all indications, the passage from notated works to non-notated practices was experienced most profoundly by David Tudor. He told an interviewer in 1972, but there's a paragraph in Busoni which speaks of notation as an evil separating musicians from music. And I feel everyone should know that this is true. I had been completely indoctrinated with the idea of faithfulness to notation in the early days. Notation is an invention of the devil. And when I became free of it, it really did a lot for me. 
By escaping notation, Tudor explains, he discovered music, which would seem to name a situation unmediated by writing and therefore free from a certain idea of authorship. For this reason, Tudor's 1960s took the form of one long emancipation from the central author in his life, John Cage. By the time Cage commented on this transformation in a letter to Christian Wolff in 1974, the process had been complete for a few years. It was not easy to bring my association with David Tudor to an end. However, it was necessary. It seemed to me he was suffering because he was doing my work, even though in my work, I was no longer determining the sound events. His 1975 letter to Toshi Ichianagi put the matter clearly. David Tudor no longer plays the piano. He is a composer of electronic music. Uh, an awareness of the end result in the 1970s helps clear up some ambiguities during the preceding transition. Not only the use, this weird use of titled works in relation to ongoing practices, like disguises or uniforms, but the occasionally strange way that Tudor and Cage described what they were doing. For example, by the early 1970s, they were each performing their own compositions simultaneously at the same time. Uh, which indicates again, uh, a certain anxiety about authorship that arose in the absence of a score and the relationships that a score mandates. Cage was stuck in a groove where only composers make formal claims on the future. Only composers write rules that limit uncertainty. Only composers govern, govern the conduct of others by ensuring a rep repetition or regularity. His understanding hadn't caught up with his practice where the rules were still written, but not in a score, in the ear, the muscles, and the memories of its performers. His slower moving conceptual apparatus led him not to notice or lend great importance to those laws of regulation that function simultaneously in the unbounded space of practice. But they were there. When the uh, trombonist Stuart Dempster joined the Merce Cunningham Dance Company for about 20 performances in the late 1970s, Tudor informed him one of our regular rules is, thou shalt not turn down another person's gain. They were loud. Another regular rule had been established years prior when Cage called a meeting to lay down the law uh, after a performance in Chicago. According to Cage, Gordon Muma, his collaborator, had clearly suggested an ABA form in their improvisation by beginning and ending uh, his contribution with the same sound. Quoting Cage, now and then things happen that I just can't accept. That was one of them. I interpret these unspoken rules and casually shared tendencies developed in the music for um, the improvisations of these groups, standing in for the uniform of the titled uh, authored work to be something akin to a band fitfully finding its sound, its own sound. In a 1978 interview, Cage described the process of making music for the loose improvisational event form that was an important part of the Cunningham Company's uh, performances in 1970. He said about the musicians, we tend not to observe, have silences. I do, but David doesn't. He is constantly making sounds in an event. So Cage is describing what they do, not a piece, a plan, nor a principle, but a practice. No notation, no, does, no design, no author. If works, plans, durational limits, or a strong author are understood to, to constrict the range of possible outcomes of a performance, to render the future more predictable, uh, to act on future actions, one might be tempted to interpret the displacement of those elements as a kind of release from constraint. Yet the domain of practice offers um, up its own specific protocols of repetition, its own hedges and instruments of prediction. As we have seen, the fetters of improvisation include uh, particular electronic setups, 
or mutually agreed upon diagrams of interaction, unspoken rules, as well as likes, dislikes, habits, and tendencies developed over years in performance together on the road. A performing personality or a style, Cage tends to have silences, Tudor tends not to, means that we can expect certain things to happen and doubt others. Many of the listeners to this talk will have already noticed that my discussion of form as it, are, as it is articulated in practice bears more than a casual similarity to the concept of habitus, familiar to readers of Marcel Mauss and especially Pierre Bourdieu. Bourdieu argued that habits, tendencies, and intuitions are formed over time and express the concrete social position of the agent. They are the result of past experiences, but also predict future patterns and therefore play a central role in social reproduction. This conference has been heavy on actor network theory uh, and what we might call the pragmatist sociology of our colleague Antoine Henniel. Uh, so it might not be necessary to recapitulate the common critique of Bourdieu's habitus that comes from ANT, namely the size of the gulf between the overarching social structure and the lone agent, uh, whose intuitions and habits are little, little more in Bourdieu's frame than the automatic application of social determinations. In the examples I discussed earlier, however, forms are both given and emergent. The tendencies of a group frequently differ from those of an individual actor, uh, and they are always transformed further through interaction with a diagram of relations, like a score, an instrument, or a technological system, uh, like the one in Variations 4. Moreover, the contours of a, of a given agency frequently shift through the mediations of these networks. Tudor discovered through practice uh, that he does not play his electronics. He responds to them. And recall that Cage merely sets the music going. Finally, the Rayner example shows how even though actors might apply historically generated forms like the conventions of the stage, they also reflect carefully on these forms and they center them as the object of their artistic investigations. Improvisation concerns the, exam the examination of habit, its undoing, and eventually its reformulation. All of these co-constitutive and indeterminate adventures of form tend to fall out of Bourdieu's model. With all of these qualifications in mind, however, the habitus is an important and powerful concept, as even Bruno Latour has admitted. My examples of form uh, in the performances of Rayner and Cage indicate the necessity of descriptions that account for all of the mediations that result in the patterns, regularities, and predictions of form. Latour draws a distinction between this concept of formalism, that is mediated, material, and emergent, or real and actual, and another approach uh, that would operate from general principles imposing a form that is already known, that is one that is potential and virtual. The really important distinction, Latour writes, is not between formal and material descriptions, but between formal descriptions of formalism and non-formal descriptions of formalism. You can count on him to put it in the most convoluted way. Um, to paraphrase him, a formal description works as if one merely divines or ascertains the form behind a repetition or a regularity, while a non-formal description of formalism also describes the work needed to produce that regularity um, and the many practical surprises one would get along the way. These non-formal descriptions of formalism help us to set aside the reductive concept of form that is little more than what uh, the anthropologist Eduardo Cohn calls the imposition of human cognitive schema or cultural categories. Cohen uses the term form to refer to any pattern that results from constraints on possibility. Foucaultian. The rock in the middle of a stream diverts water around it in a persistent and stable flow. It outlines a form. Form reduces possibility in an entropic world. Acting inside of form is effortless, 
one does not even know that one is doing it. To come back to the language of Foucault, form conducts the conduct of another, form governs. Latour offers some interesting ways to think about the governance of form. He writes that form is simply something which allows something else to be transported from one site to another. Think of a map, a script, a score. Each of these inscriptions help to take this moment here and now and repeat it somewhere else. They all reduce possibility. In fact, as many here know, Latour referred to these little bits of form as immutable mobiles, mobiles, because they remain consistent in their constraints, even as they make possible wider circuits of action. To quote Latour, they give us a way to make formalism a more mundane and more material reality. To go from empirical to theoretical sciences is to go from slower to faster mobiles, from more mutable to less mutable inscriptions. Indeed, what we call formalism is the acceleration of displacement without transformation. Immutable mobiles, Latour concludes, afford domination at a distance. Once possibility is constrained, we live in the form effortlessly and build others on top. Form governs. So to conclude this talk, I want to reiterate two points from the discussion. Neither of them are original, <laughs> and they certainly don't belong to me. Um, the first is that institutional logics of social reproduction work at many different scales at the same time, from the concrete behaviors of the individual to the effects of diffuse concepts like authorship. The second is that the empirical study of material mediation does not and should not preclude attention to formalisms of various kinds. I'm lingering on these simple truths for a reason that I haven't mentioned yet at all, but I will now. <laughs> Namely, because of the self-evident importance of these truths to how a contemporary regime of power constitutes the agent as an object of knowledge. I'm referring to the regime theorized variously as data power or soft bio biopolitics or info power. New developments in human geography articulate an informational person through digital surveillance and artificial intelligence. These operations, for example, guide the targeting of drone strikes in the global war on terror, but this is only the most spectacular and menacing manifestation of an utterly commonplace system of control. Facial identification and biometric scanning are regular features of international borders, and some government security services now employ gate or movement recognition technology. Like Yvonne Rayner concluded 50 years before, they know that a single person's walk is theirs and theirs alone. But these are only the beginning. Philosopher Gregoire Chamayou points out that so-called pattern of life analysis is predicated on behavioral regularities rather than on the recognition of nominal identities. What you buy, where and when you buy it, who you meet with and where you go, pattern of life fundamentally rethinks what an agent is or how one might be isolated according to formal algorithms uh, that, that leave individuals themselves relatively um, anonymous. Yes, this power arrangement depends on many non-human actors to operate, like phones and satellites and cameras, but it seems to me that the real significance of this regime is how it conceives or indeed formulates the individual agent as a series of patterns or regularities that can be predicted and therefore governed. So I realize that it takes a rather large leap of interpretation and analysis to go from John Cage and Yvonne Rayner in the 1960s to the global war on terror and the digital dystopia of the present. But the genealogy of this informational person extends far back to the turn of the 20th century according to the philosopher Colin Koopman, who I think is very good on this question. 
Uh, this regime's conditions of possibility, its problems, its questions, its positions, they only emerged haltingly over decades and decades. I'm not suggesting that artists like Cage and Rayner anticipated contemporary info power or anything like that. But I do think that uh, this avant-garde, like any, reflects existing and emergent power relations simply by responding to the same broad conditions of possibility. And I like working uh, not just on any historical actors, but on artists for precisely this reason. Um, and that is that they were often struggling with the same problems in practice that we are struggling with in theory. Thank you. <laughs>